for an early morning, uh, and it is once again symbolic of why I love Prince George's County so much. We have the most engaged citizens anywhere, and so we are so grateful uh, for all of you. I want to thank Mr. Holloway as well uh, for hosting us today. I want to thank our delegate Proctor. She has done an amazing job. Uh, she's, so, she's also part of an amazing team uh, of delegates. And, uh, and so I guess the way I'll start is, uh, I'm not counting, but I've been in office now, I think it's been 155 days. <laughs> and, and I can tell you, quite truthfully, I have had more fun than I deserve. Uh, I love this job so much. I have enjoyed representing all of you. And most of it's come because I'm a part of an amazing team. Uh, we recognize that there's so little that we do alone. But there's a lot that we can accomplish when we work together, and uh, I'm honored today. I'm joined. I couldn't even go around the room and name all of these amazing uh, folks who represent you, the professionals uh, who are here. You heard from the chief. We have our fire chief. We just have so many amazing our uh, agency directors are here. Uh, but I've just been really fortunate, and I'm not just saying this, to come into office at a time where we are served by some of the best professionals anywhere. Uh, we also have with us our chairman of our economic matters, uh, uh, del uh, in the delegation, uh, Delegate Derek Davis, who also has done an amazing job. I want to thank him for being here today, and Sarita Lee. Uh, so what I should tell you, I'll get right to it. We have been busy. Uh, we have really been, uh, we've had a really active 155 days, came into office, uh, really in two lucky points. One is the beginning of the legislative session in Annapolis. And this was really fortunate for us because it gave us the opportunity to focus in a laser-like fashion right away on the priorities that we have set together as a community. Uh, we have also uh, come into office at the time that we were working on a budget. So I'll begin by telling you um, how we began to attack those two issues. First was education, uh, because we heard very loudly and clearly from this community uh, that we were concerned about our educational system. Um, I'll say it this way, the chief came up and he had an opportunity to talk, I'm sure, about how we've done in public safety. And I can tell you, we have the strongest public safety team across the board, anywhere in the state of Maryland, and this is not exaggeration. <laughs> but we have a chief who is overseeing a reduction in crime that puts us at the lowest rate we've had in over five decades is simply amazing. It is simply amazing. Uh, but what he has done and what we did together over the last eight years is to allow us now not to be characterized any longer as a jurisdiction that is characterized by crime and corruption. There used to be a time where there was no conversation that could happen about Prince George's County that didn't start out talking about crime and corruption, how violent we were. Uh, we were on the news for it every day, and we are so grateful that together, because this is something that only happens when the community is engaged. We have successfully, and we didn't cure crimes. I don't want anybody to walk away and say, county executive is crazy, she thinks we cured crime. We have not cured crime, but we have certainly allowed us now the privilege, and I think it really is a privilege, to focus on so many of the other issues that have been of concern to us as a community for so long, starting with our school system. Our reputation does rest on what happens in our school system. Much of what I suspect you'll ask me about today, including development, how we get these businesses here on Route 210 and other places, how we develop, how we bring the quality food that we deserve, how we bring the quality retail that we deserve, how we get the health care that we deserve. All of those issues really do get connected to our reputation. And our reputation determines whether or not people want to come here and invest. And part of that has to do with the reputation of our school system. Now that's not the only reason that this is important because we believe that the education of our Children is the most sacred obligation that we have. It is also the civil rights issue of today. What happens in the education of our children? So we went to Annapolis and we were very aggressive about it. I have to tell you that but we were led by a legislative team that again is the baddest legislative team in Annapolis. And I don't say that shamefully, they are just amazing. But we went to Annapolis and we were very aggressive about the fact that Prince George's County is the crown jewel of Maryland and that they, we deserve the lion's share of the funding that comes to education. This is a fact. There are a few reasons why we deserve the lion's share, and the state's primary obligation is education. If you look at the state constitution, the truth, the function of state government, its first, its first obligation is to fund education. If they do nothing else, the state is obligated to fund education. 
And we believe that Prince George's County is, of course, due a disproportionate share of that because we educate the largest number of disabled students in the state of Maryland. We educate the largest number of students who speak English as a second language. And we also educate 62% of our kids are on free and reduced lunch. So we educate a large at-risk population of students. So this means as they consider, consider how the money will be allocated, Prince George's County deserves the lion's share of the funding. And I'm also going to thank you for this question too. And another issue, and I already, I know you're coming to this, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. I get the question all the time about well, what was MGM for? And we're concerned about funding, right? Okay, I, I, I already know I'm coming right at you because I already know what the questions are. Well, what, why did we agree to MGM? And the truth is, and we didn't agree to it lightly. Prince George's County is a deeply spiritual place. We have, all, we have over 800 churches, and a lot of people voted for casinos against their values. If I'm honest about it, there are a lot of people who didn't want the casino but said, well, if we're promised that this money can help fund our children's education, well, then we'll agree to it, right? So the question is then, well, where's the money? This is a great question. A casino that generates on many months more than $60 million per month. The question is, why would we ever be in a position to beg for money? for education, right? If we were told that the, the whole purpose was to fund education. So I have an answer for you about that. Where did the money go? There's something called an education trust fund. And, and, and contrary to what people believe, the money from the casino does not come straight to our general fund in Prince George's County. It goes to the state's education trust fund. This has been the problem for us. Is that the money, could, how it was used, would be determined by the governor and, the, and those state officials will determine how the money would be allocated. And we had some legislation that you all voted for in the last election cycle called lockbox legislation that says the money now must all come to education, finally. So out of the six casinos in the state of Maryland, again, MGM, which is first of all, the top taxpayer in Prince George's County. So MGM is the number one tax generator in Prince George's County. And it is not only that, but it's also the top grossing casino in the state of Maryland. So when we went without legislative team, we really had an attitude to say, give us our money. <laughs> we're here, we're here to, to bring back the money to Prince George's County for our children that they deserve. Where's our money? We have two categories that we made it be known. First of all, we have a huge backlog of repairs that need to be done. We have eight and a half billion dollars worth of backlog for our kids' schools. HVAC systems, you hear when the schools start in the, in the summer, there's always a problem with the air conditioning breaking, the heating is not working, mold and mildew, the facilities are out of date. We have the second oldest schools in the state. And so we put together a very aggressive plan called the P3 print plan. You may have read about it in the Washington Post. It's, it's a new and innovative approach to building schools, which will allow us at less cost um, and at a quicker rate build schools and, and really eliminate this backlog that we have. The P3 is a public-private partnership. And again, it was written about in the Washington Post, this has never been done in Maryland, and is a model for the country, which says we have a private entity that comes in to finance the school, build the schools, and does something else very important, maintains the schools. So by agreement, first of all, we don't pay a penny until the schools are built and our children are in those schools. The other thing that, we, that the agreement says is that they must maintain these schools for us for the length of the agreement, which will be 20 to 30 years. They have to hand back to us schools that are in a certain condition. And this means that we will be able to build, we think, 18 schools in the next seven years using this model. It's unbelievable. It will save us $180 million on maintenance. And so we went to the state and said, not only want that structure, but we want the state now to give us 25 to, mil 25 to 30 additional million dollars every year for the next 20 years to fund it. The school system and the county will add money to that as well. So we expect to have up to an additional $90 million that we're going to invest in this every year until we get this backlog eliminated. You know, I think that will do something great. It will not only uh, give our kids the schools that they deserve, the buildings that respect their dignity, but it will also attract to us new families who are sending their kids to private schools and who have decided not to invest in our school system. So this is our P3 approach that we uh, asked for. You may have heard about the Kerwin Commission. Uh, if you haven't heard of Kerwin, many of you know about Dr. Alan Thornton. 
that heard about him for many years in the funding formula. With Kirkland is the formula also that determines how much money comes to our school based on the criteria that I told you. And I want you to know that we brought back this year an additional $53 million for operational costs for our schools as well as a result of Kirkland. And when we go back to Annapolis in January, we're going to expect to bring back even more money than that. So this is what we have. important. We have a $4.2 billion budget in our county, and I want you to know that 60% of our budget goes to our school system. 20, another 20% 20 goes to public safety. And what does this mean for us? It means over 80% of our budget goes to schools and public safety alone. Now, we believe this is the right investment because we deserve to be safe, and we, again, a big progressive society has great schools. So we make that investment, but the other reason that I raise this for you is because it also paints another picture for us. That we have about 18% left of our budget to do everything else that's important to us. That's tough. That means road improvements. That means what we need to do in terms of, um, of um, everything else, health and human services, all of the things that we need for our seniors and for the disabled community, all of the other needs that we have as a community, we pay for with that maybe 18%. Now, the reason that I share that with you is because as we talk about economic development, I want you to understand why it's so important. It is important because of our quality of life, but the other thing is we have long overtaxed Prince George's. And what I mean by that is we, on the backs of the people who live here, fund the government. The bulk of our tax structure is on residential property taxes. There was a question from this group about what did I mean when I talked about the fact we could change the tax structure in the county. This is what I'm talking about, is that the bulk of our taxes, the things, again, that pay for your public safety and transportation and all of the other things we need, it comes from your property taxes. This is not a sustainable model. It is not a sustainable model. So it means that counties like Montgomery County have doubled the accessible tax base, meaning they have to double the money to draw upon to pay for the things they need because they have commercial taxes to rely on. That's the reason I explained to you that even though many people oppose MGM, it is the number one taxpayer in Prince George's County. The truth of it is we need more businesses that come here and are able to pay commercial uh, property taxes instead of all residential taxes. So generating business is key for us. It's very important. It is very important. So we have been really focused on making sure that we attract more and more business to Prince George's. And I want you to know that we're succeeding at this. Now, the reason I say that is I just uh, came back from New York a couple of weeks ago for something called a bond rating trip, where we go and talk to the rating agencies on Wall Street about the, the county's credit worthiness. And part of what we talked about with them is that the county has the highest credit rating possible. Uh, we're only one of fewer than 50 counties in the country that have a, the perfect credit score. Prince George's has a perfect credit score. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I have to be honest with you, I just got here 155 days ago. So I cannot claim credit for the perfect credit score, right? But what I can do is assure you that we will continue the fiscal policies that have allowed us to have a perfect credit score. Our finances have been well managed. And part of what we also discussed is the fact that our commercial tax um, rate is growing. We've seen evidence over the last four or five years as a result of the previous administration that we are growing that commercial tax base. In fact, we've seen about a four to five percentage point gain over the last several years. And so we are growing in that regard. But I know 210, I want you to know that I am laser focused. Uh, we have something called food deserts in Prince George's County. You all may know what I mean by that. Uh, in fact, of all of our areas, 15% of our residents live in what's known as a food desert. And this is the highest concentration of food deserts in the region, are, are the, the areas that we live in. I grew up right here in Camp Springs, Maryland. It's listed as one of the food deserts. I know what that means. It means that my parents go to a giant food store right there on Allentown Road where they return spoiled food loans every week. This makes me so irate. I see stars when I realize that our residents are not only in places do, that do not offer enough quality food options, but that we're begging also for the kind of quality grocers that we deserve. Where are Trader Joe's? We need more Whole Foods. We need more Harris Tears, right? <laughs> We have analyzed the 
42 shopping centers across the county, including many of them right here in South County. And this brother, the 27 of them are, are, are really in dire need of repair. And so part of what we were able to get out of that was this money for facade improvements to really improve the look of these uh, malls to help assist the owners so that they can make additional investments in these shopping centers. Uh, we are also going to be very aggressively going out to get grocers to come here. We're going to Las Vegas uh, at the end of the month. So if y'all need to them take time to get to Vegas, I'm not their dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening, okay? I will be on the plane headed to Las Vegas, but I will not be their dad. In fact, I'm going to be there with a team of economic development professionals who are, we have a strategy, a business retention and business attraction strategy to go there and go after these grocers and to try to pitch Prince George's County to encourage them to come and bring their businesses here, the grocers, the restaurants, the retail, uh, and they're all at a shopping center convention in Las Vegas. And in fact, the chief, and I love this, is coming with us this year because, it's, because we have a story to tell. Part of what they want to know is whether it's safe. And we thought, well, you know what? Well, who can better tell the story than the man who's done it better than anybody in Maryland? And I'm a little immodest about it, but I think better than anyone in America. So we're going to take him with us to Las Vegas. He's going to be a part of that team. Uh, and we're putting together a whole strategy to attract businesses to Prince George's County. So you all keep your fingers crossed for us. We're going to be very aggressive when we go there. Um, how many were able to participate in our growing ring of pride? I know some of you were out this weekend. Thank you so much. Uh, and I have to tell you about the beautification. It is amazing. You know, 17% of Prince George's do not have kids in our school system. They don't. So when we talk about how your tax dollars are used, most people tell me they love kids. They want the schools to be great, but I want to know what the government's doing for me. And in fact, I want to know when you all are going to clean up this living trash. We want a community that reflects the pride that we feel in it. And we want to know that the government is nimble, that is responsive. When I called, my father told me that he made a call uh, to 311. He claimed his call was not answered timely. He told me if we didn't get it together, he and my mother, when they put their money together, were moving right out of Sixth Street. <laughs> I told him, no, you're not. You're going to wait for us to make sure we're going to deliver to you what we deserve. But I understand the frustration that comes with this, right? And so we have been also making sure we responded to your concern about beautification. I heard it over and over again. The litter. You drive up the road and look at these meetings. And you know, and it's not only that, but then people decided they should dump couches and refrigerators and tires and all kinds of other ridiculous matter in Prince George's. So we got something for them. I want to tell you what it is. Well, the first thing is we have 10 now cameras, hidden cameras, in various locations across the county. So I want y'all to let them know, tell them. County executive says she got your eye on you. <laughs> so these decided to go. These are not fixed cameras, they're mobile cameras. So when they discover us and decide to go dump somewhere else, we're going to move the camera over there too. And in fact, the chief and the department just busted some folks this past weekend, right? With a raggy, old raggy pickup truck off of the company and dumped some back in the county. And we took that camera that way, we're going to start taking people who do that kind of activity, took them right off the jail. And this yes. is what we do. So, we had to increase the fines for illegal dumping. That was part of the work we did in Annapolis. Uh, was to increase the fines to make sure that we're able to hold accountable people were done. We had these uh, cameras that we're going to be moving around to photograph and shame and prosecute people who are illegally dumping. Uh, we also have the Department of Public Works and Transportation, and they have done a litter blitzes. Have you all been seeing the litter blitzes? I hope you've seen our trucks out, right? We've been so proud of that because what we said is, look, I want to see some action, right? We want the trucks out, visible making sure that we're taking these signs about the media. Please let people know they have a beautiful babysitting service. They are uh, offering tutoring, or they buy and sell houses. Do not advertise that in our meetings. Please, right? <laughs> <laughs> goldfish, whatever it is. They do. <laughs> we do not want those ugly signs. They are polluting our media strips. And so this is the reason that we are also engaging the community is this is the work we're going to do together, right? We set new standards for how people treat us and treat our community. 
and polluting and littering and all of those things are not acceptable in Prince George's County. So the chief has taken this on so personally. He took his truck out and he said, have you all seen him out there? He's beautiful. I think he signs about the road. He's so disturbed by it. He, he takes hours and he collects signs too. And I thank him and thank so many of you also who have done the same. So the beautification effort is ongoing. We also um, made some other investments to make sure that it will be robust. Bulky trash. Bulky trash collection has not been what it should be. Uh, and part of the problem with that is that we didn't have the vehicles. Our vehicles, we're embarrassed to say, they were in such disrepair, the vehicles were broken down. So we had to buy new vehicles to make sure that we could have a robust bulky trash collection. Uh, and so we've done that, we made investments there. Uh, we've also invested, uh, the Department of Permitting Inspections and Enforcement, Melinda Bowling is here. Uh, and I want to thank her for being here. And, uh, and, uh, and we also invested in DPI, uh, 15 new inspectors, so code enforcement. So again, we got our to make sure that our neighborhoods are, are up to par. And 311, so we have some amazing people. It's Melinda, Unisha Davis is here. I saw her a moment ago there. It's Unisha. Uh, and one of the people I have to tell you that Unisha done such an amazing job. I've never heard it before. When the council members told me, I love her so much, I want to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> she, has done, <laughs> she has gotten 311 back up and operational. There was a time where it took 3 minutes and 47 seconds to have your call answered. This is too long. This is probably one of those calls my father was trying to make. <laughs> it's too long. And she's gotten it down now to 17 seconds. <laughs> and now, within 48 hours, and so many of the concerns you have, we want you to start utilizing 311. If it's a pothole, if it's a tree down, if it's a sidewalk that is uneven. Uh, I've heard people complain that when our trash vendors come out to collect trash, somebody told me that if I wanted to get rid of my littering problem, I just hold these trash companies accountable because they need more litter than they pick up, right? Uh, but you can call 311 if that is the case, but 311 is there to respond to you as well. Uh, let me see. Hopefully, I've gotten through a lot of what I wanted to share, and I know you have questions for me as well. Um, but those are some of the areas we've worked on. We have um, a beautiful summer jobs program that we're really proud of. We're taking good care of our kids. Um, I can stand up here and talk to you about kids and seniors. The two categories of people that everyone knows I love, 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 and will go to the moon and back for are our seniors and our kids. Um, and so the top on our agenda is to really uh, make sure we make investments. We put additional $10 million in our budget to help with seniors. Uh, we have a, a pantry that is going to, um, to, to be located in various places around the county just for seniors um, to make sure that many of the, the needs that they have, including food and clothing and other things, we have a pantry, a senior pantry that's going to be roaming around the county. Uh, we're keeping our eye on activities for seniors. The seniors tell me they have difficulty with transportation in the county. So we invest in 20 new buses to make sure that our seniors can get around. Because <laughs> we have active seniors in Prince George. They do not want to sit at home. They're out of line dancing, painting, uh, sitting home with photography. Uh, my mother was at a floral arranging class last week. These seniors in Prince George are active. And so we've invested in the bus system to make sure they can get around for our kids. Uh, the summer jobs program, we uh, traditionally hired about 3,000 kids. This summer we're hiring uh, over 6,000. We had we really increased the program to such a point. We had 10,000 kids apply for our summer jobs program this summer. We made an additional $4 million investment for our kids. Uh, and we also invested in youth sports. Our youth sports program needed a lot of work. Uh, we were covering the turf fields in the northern part of the county, but guess what? We put in $18 million to make sure that all of our fields are covered and our kids are safe and that they have a chance to develop emotionally and physically. And this is what sports allows them to do, so we've made great investments in that area um, as well. So I think I know you have questions. Uh, I'm going to stop because if you can't tell, I can go all day long talking about Prince George's County. Um, it is my favorite topic of conversation, um, but I want to stop and pause, and, and I just want to also, before I take questions, say thank you. Uh, for those who have not had a chance to personally thank, I have to tell you, I am so grateful. Um, thank you for the chance to represent all of you all, so I just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we are working together. 
and we're working as hard as we can to make sure that the pride that we all feel in our community uh, is acknowledged and respected at all times. This is a hardworking administration. I'm so blessed uh, to have the people around this room who have agreed to join me in this effort to continue to send a message that Prince George's County is second to none. Uh, this is the crown jewel of Maryland. We say it everywhere we go, but because of you, it is truly the case. So thank you so much for it. such a wonderful Good morning, everyone. My name is Joyce Orr. Since June of 2015, I have had an illegal short-term rental right next door to me. EPI has tried to shut them down. We have been through the Board of Appeals, sitting as the zoning board. We have done everything we possibly can. To date, I have raw sewage backing up in my house from their illegal tap into my sewer system. To date, right now. We took their USNC, my warranty company, and specialist plumbers running on cameras down my pipes, putting in a tie-in to their USNC, and digging up a quarter of my backyard in order to run the camera through to see what the problem was. So whenever they have Roto Rooter or whomever come to push whatever their guests have put down in the sewer system, apparently my pipe is a little lower, the legal pipe and it pushes it into the system and up into my basement. Can someone please? Now I know that the CB10 and CB11 passed, and many of you are going to have short-term rentals right next door to you. The county passed it to get a few extra dollars, but people like me are suffering. There'll be eight people per night for 180 days allowed to stay next door to you, look it up, CB10, CB11. And the closer you are to something like National Harbor, which I'm a block and a half from, the more people are coming. We have serious traffic problems because Uber and Lyft stop every few minutes. And then my, and again, these are little narrow streets in Prince George is coming. I'm suffering, my neighbors are suffering. They went with me to the county. Can you please, it's still illegal, can you shut 425 Rosier Road in Fort Washington down now? <laughs> we have Melinda Spalling here. And she got the address and these people are in big trouble. So yes, I have uh, my staff here inspectors since we've got the address. We'll come up with a strategy before you leave today. We'll make sure we connect with you to talk to you about next steps for enforcement. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I have a question. T and I, I'm the chief of last night. Uh, I started with T and I in 2011. Oh, T and I. I'm going to do the old today. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started with TNI in 2011 in Glass Manor. I think we were one of the first communities that started out. Uh, I think it's a great program, and what I'm trying to find out is there any changes with TNI? Shh. Yeah. Okay. There are, and, we, and the chief is going to come up and we <laughs> talk about Perfect. T and I, Transport Community Roads Initiative, is one of the things that I often point to <coughs> that complements everything that all men and women in uniform have done to get us where we are today in terms of crime. Because it's a multidisciplinary approach. It's DPI, it's DPWT, social services, all my friends in the program. So, Unisha and I have become fast partners. We've had a series of meetings. But if you recall, and you do recall, because we've been in this since the very beginning, the whole idea of TNI, once it was fully realized, was that it would become a governance model as opposed to a particular place. So, what we're looking at now is how we take that from particular communities and we're going to regionalize it. So, north, central, south, probably, maybe north and south, depending on how it plays out. And then beyond that, continue to develop the 311 and continue to develop the most important piece. And I went with our county staff team to Baltimore yesterday to talk about how we use data to 
to get good results for community and integrate those in a better way so that you will get more speedy service delivery, more effective use of all of our resources, which are not infinite, to get the greatest result for you. So it's, it's developing, it's evolving, and I believe, based on our kind of executive leadership and this new partnership, that it's going to be even more effective than it has been. And it's one of the things that I point to as our road forward, because right now, and the county executive said it, even if you adjust for population, crime has never been lower in Prince George's County. But we can still do more. We can still do more. But we're subject matter experts in terms of crime fighting. I need subject matter experts in terms of permitting and inspection, the social services, the family services, homeland security, all of our friends, all my friends. Um, and that's the model that's going to have us all impact that environment that makes business more viable and brings business more business to Prince George's County. And I'll also be singing in Las Vegas. <laughs> So I get that too. So this thing between us doesn't work out. I'll be doing this in after review. And so um, the model has, has been a wonderful model, but now we are going to take that countywide. Yeah. And so one one of the um, I would say one of the uh, uh, thoughts, um, you know, of course, is going to take it countywide because resources belong to all residents. And so some people may have felt that they were left out because they were not a TNI model. So we're going to change that nice model, but we're now going to make it countywide and make it more broad so that everyone can be included. Thank you for having this opportunity. Chief, you may need to move back up. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I moved here 30 years ago, and I was really disappointed in the education system. I moved here from Pennsylvania, and uh, disappointed. So I'm glad that education is the top priority for you. One of the concerns I, uh, concerns I have in education uh, recently, and it uh, connected with both the chief and yourself is that uh, we haven't, as far as I know, haven't had a school shooting incident. And I'm glad that we have. For the chief, my question is that uh, what type of response system, protection system, are we doing for our children? Uh, and also, as part of the response and education system, are we going into the schools and talking to the kids such that they don't feel like they have to? Because a lot of these, these, these uh, shootings are by students themselves, and that's a shame. So anyway, that's the first question. The second question is going to be to the county executive in that my understanding from reading the newspapers, all right, you, you indicated that education's first, and you're going to do this P3 program to do so many schools. Now, a lot of jurisdictions are doing building in protection systems for those children in those schools. So in all these new schools that you indicate are going to be built are newer protection systems going to be included? Okay, so I don't sleep. It's true. Um, and to answer your question directly, there hasn't been a homicide in this county in the last six, going on seven years now that I haven't been at if I was in for sure this town. And you know I'm not from someplace else. With respect to that particular issue, we created a few years ago when we did the restructuring, right? The other half of our success, coming back to the question about conforming neighborhoods, is how we restructured this police department to meet the needs of Prince George County as it exists today. And we evolved that year over year over year, as opposed to how it was when we took over, frankly, and that was a couple decades in the past. So we created the Bureau of Homeland Security. You may have 
seen me on television a couple weeks ago talking about how we had an arrested individual who was planning a terrorist attack in the National Harbor. I have an entire squad of detectives who are, and, and myself, have top secret clearances with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We get briefed in on national security briefings on a regular basis. We get intelligence from our federal partners across all those three-letter organizations that you know so well who tell us about threats at the local level, state level, and local level. That same component, who's completely tuned in with those sorts of threats, handles every single threat of school shooting that we get. So every single one is run down. As soon as I get it, I talk to Dr. Golson and Mr. Stanton, and then I brief the DCAO for public safety. And then that group of detectives with FBI agents, sometimes with our partners in Homeland Security or DEA or ATF, go, we intervene at the school, we have our patrol group, and that's Nikki and JJ, at the school as an additional measure of security with our school resource officer who's already there every day anyways and has the kind of training you're talking about. And then we run that threat down to the individual who sent it. A lot of that social media, and don't tell anybody, but it's not too hard to run those down because the social media leads us right back to them. Now, beyond that, we are working with the school system to make those schools less attractive targets, but I will tell you it's disturbing to me the number of threats that we get. Beyond that, we have quarterly active shooter training. So all of our officers <coughs> quarterly, and this is not found in places around the country, engage in active shooter training, and I'm very proud of my fire chief, because what we're doing together now is we're integrating fire and police. So God forbid we do have an active shooter, we'll have teams of police officers leading in medics with us to intervene and then to bring victims out as opposed to waiting until we completely secure that scene. That's a work in progress, but that's the next step that we're taking so that if God forbid that does happen, and what you've heard me say here before is my role and our role is to close the window on a sophisticated response to some sort of incident like that. And that window is getting very small right now. We do, and I'll be frank with you because I don't keep anything from you, we get one or two of those school shooting threats daily for a while, especially at the parkway, now we get a couple a week, and I will promise you this, if you have an interest, uh, Deputy Chief Rob Harvin is the one who leads that effort for me. But again, Rob doesn't sleep either. So as soon as we get those, middle of the night, first thing in the morning, Saturday, whatever it is, we run those things down and we ensure the safety of everybody. And then where action has been taken in response to that threat, we make arrests and we prosecute people. Is that fair? And I just want to add one piece to that. So the Chief, and his team does an amazing job of responding to these sorts of threats and responding to incidents. But one of the things that we have to do better is to deal with our kids. These, these are some of the most stressed out children, uh, really of any generation. The amount of stress and pressure and frustration. So we're dealing with a whole population of kids who really need uh, coping skills. Many of them do not have conflict resolution skills. Um, because of social media, they have not uh, learned how to, um, to de-escalate situations by simply communicating with each other. And so I think we have to do two things. is We are prepared to respond. God forbid anything should happen. The school psychologists, making sure that our kids are able to receive the treatment that they need for mental health for conditions, uh, and really being able to have people who can also spot children who are in distress, early, this is going to be so important because it is not just that we are seeing more and more of these active shooter cases, but we're seeing really um, historic levels of suicide and other things. And so our kids are in grave distress. And so it is important that we're not just going to respond, but if we really want to see a decline in all of these sort of violence, we're going to have to get into these schools and get into their families and deal with the distress, the extreme distress that these kids are under. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. My name is Khalila Denny, Khalila Denny House, Incorporated. And mine's more of a comment um, from the beginning. I want to say thank you for your efforts and beautification in our community. Um, the youth that we work with and that we hear from are just as excited about cleaning up their community than that you are and that we are. And I just want to say thank you for um, just all that you're doing as it relates to that and engaging the youth in the community and being a part of beautifying their community. 
Um, and also, I want to just ask if you could speak more on the uh, second trash pickup day, the composting, and how that's going to um, help in that effort. Thank you. So, I told you that I've been hearing about the trash. <laughs> so, let me tell you, uh, when I'm in the 7-Eleven, I generally get co coffee almost every day. Um, and when I was at the gas station, a resident said to me, this trash, the two-day-a-week trash, if you don't do something, because I am eating crabs, I have barbecue on the weekends, and this is creating a real problem for me. Because the one day a week is really, uh, really infringing on my lifestyle. And they tell me, if you don't do something about this trash, you're going to run you out of Prince George's County. So I got it. I don't know how to here. We went to the Department of Environmental Services to say, find us a responsible way to return to two day a week trash. And what they came back with was, we are already uh, involved in a composting program that we have done on a pilot basis. The composting program is so smart. Uh, because we currently have the contracts that will allow us to now do a second day of trash collection. But on the second day of trash collection, we're going to do food waste only. Now what that means is that we will give you a, a new container. The container means that you put food waste for the second day uh, in this container only. And we will come around on that day of the week to pick up the the food waste with people, by the way, it won't cost us the seven to ten million dollars that it would cost for us to return to the second day of just general trash. But not only will we be able to collect your food waste, but we're going to compost to really grow our composting program and make some money as well. So we'll now return to two day a week trash. We're going to make sure that we uh, will communicate a lot about this before we do it. And we're doing it uh, a certain amount of households at a time, about 3,000 households at a time. Because part of the problem with going back from two day a week to one way day a week is that we did it so abruptly that we really didn't allow for time for us to learn uh, from our mistakes as we went along. So we're going to do this similar to how we did recycling, which is to do it incrementally across the county. We'll communicate with you quite a lot beforehand uh, because I know that this is something that people are not accustomed to doing. Uh, but we want to engage the community in all of these really smart ways. Uh, that we can deal with the trash, but do so at, at not an addition on that huge cost of coming to cost savings, but it will allow us the second day for all those who say that the real issue is that they have trash sitting around that's attracting maggots and other, um, you know, uh, cats and all kinds of things, and we will come around and collect that. So that's what we'll do the second day, is we're now going to um, an extended program, a food waste program, uh, where we will come around on the second day and get food waste only, and then uh, on that initial day that you still have, we'll do all other trash. Um, so that's that's what we're doing with the two day only trash. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I just think this forum is fantastic. I just want to underscore the importance of what you were just talking about, um, County Executive, on the importance of mental health. I don't know if everyone knows that this month is Mental Health Awareness Month, and there's actually a, um, if this is Mental Health Awareness Month for children in particular, there's a county um, event in Prince George's County at the Recreational Center. I am here on behalf of Family Matters. Um, Mental wellness is a journey, and we really want to talk about the importance of people breaking the stigma around mental health, everything from depression to post-traumatic stress disorder, um, letting people know that there are resources. We are in Oxon Hill, right across the street from um, Rivertown uh, Shopping Center. We just had an outdoor wellness festival, and we had the community come out. We would love for all of you all to be there next year and to continue the conversation about getting help. But we um, think that it's really just as important as getting your teeth clean and getting an annual checkup. Mental fitness and mental wellness should be part of everyone's sort of holistic lifestyle. So we just want to raise awareness and thank you for the opportunity. And we're going to continue the conversation about the importance of collaborating <coughs> together to solve this. One out of five um, Americans suffer from mental health condition, and that's over 150,000 Prince George's County residents. So we really want to you know, tackle that um, issue collectively. So thank you. Shane was much. Thank you. Let me, let me uh, kind of interject. Hold that thought. Let me just say that uh, we had questions submitted. I know a number of you submitted questions. You would like the answers from those. 
we're trying to get a, you know, a feel for just general questions. We got those. You man, we could address her back, and then the questions that were submitted to me. Okay. So I just think uh, we agree. We couldn't agree more about mental health care and addiction care. Those are two areas that we believe that were long neglected in the county. I've been talking to our state senators, I'm sorry, our uh, U.S. senators, uh, about addiction care. Seventy-five percent of the people who come into our correctional facilities every day in Upper Marlboro are intoxicated when they get there. Uh, yet we don't have even one detox center on Prince George's County, so we're working now to correct that. The same is true for mental health. Um, over a third of all the people we arrest every day and take to our correctional facility suffer from mental illness. And so it has become the case that we care for people who are mentally ill or addicted in jail. And there's something wrong about that. So we have to do a much better job of doing community-based treatment and diagnosis. And unfortunately, a lot of that is in the schools. It's where we find it. It's, it starts very early. There are lots of reasons for it, including trauma and some other things. But we're going to do a better job of, um, of making sure we get to that. Let me see some of the questions that were submitted, um, and I tried to answer some of them, and my general comments tried to weave them in, but let me just make sure I am answering. I know there was a question about MGM, we talked about that, um, and let's see, and then there's a question about an inspector general for the county. We have an office of ethics and accountability. Um, that currently already works on issues around ethics, and so at this point at least, we don't feel that there's a need to set to develop a whole separate system where we have an office office of ethics and accountability uh, that deals with ethics. We think that's very important. Um, there is um, there's a question here about T and I that we've already seen the, the investments being made from gambling. We uh, answer that. There's a question concerning gentrification. Um, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure. If the person who submitted this question is here, I'd like to know more about what you meant. But I think people are concerned about being able to stay in their homes. Um, is kind of what I'm hearing, I think, in this question. Ma'am, if I may, that's been a question asked several times before, and it was exactly that. We got folks being priced out of their homes. Uh, most of the folks here are senior citizens who, who that's the baseline for income in Prince George's County. Now you keep raising the rent, move me out. I got no place to go, and and we're not we don't have the income to, to support that or keep keep pace with that. So I, if I'm not mistaken, the question person not here. That's how it's been okay. addressed before. So we, we want to make sure again um, as we talk about tax policy and making sure again that we are shifting um, the primary kind of tax burden to the commercial tax base and not continuing to shift it to our residents, that's part of it. But the other thing is that we have to make sure, um, especially if we see new development occurring, that we are working as a government uh, to incentivize a mixed, um, a mixed income facility so that our seniors can afford, and also millennials and firefighters and teachers and others can also afford uh, to continue to live in Prince George's County. So what I can tell you is that we will keep our eye on affordability um, but one other thing I should tell you, and I'm glad that this question came up because it gave me a chance, gives me a chance to answer this, is that we are laser focused. What I forgot to mention is in our economic development strategy, the strategy is not to build new on every space of land. I can tell you that our administration is very focused on investment in current neighborhoods and communities. So, re, so making sure that we are investing in revitalizing and putting money into neighborhoods and communities that are already existing, and that will help. Uh, I believe, to make sure that people can stay in their homes. Uh, we are also, we have money that we brought back from Annapolis to, to deal with abandoned and vacant homes, uh, to make sure that we're, again, really investing in current neighborhoods. And so for our seniors, we'll keep our eye on that. I know this is an ongoing concern uh, that we've heard. We are really, uh, in our housing strategy, we have a whole new strategy that the county council passed. Uh, part of that is making sure that housing remains affordable for seniors. So that's one of the uh, questions. O Oxen Cove. That there's been a lot of discussion on Oxen Code. That's one of the questions here. Um, I think the uh, governor unwittingly uh, created a whole conversation around Oxen Code and the Washington Redskins. I went on record to say that I am a long suffering Redskins fan. <laughs> <laughs> that we should hand over Oxen Code to the Redskins or anybody else. First of all, we don't own Oxen Code. Oxen Code is currently uh, a federal owned. Um, and this is protected land that the federal government still retains the rights to. Prince George's County doesn't have it, nor does the state of Maryland. Um, so there is no plan at present to do anything with Oxen Code except to continue to protect it 
Um, and should there ever come an opportunity to discuss what might be developed on Oxen Code, you have my solemn commitment that I would never engage in a discussion regarding how to develop it without community support. Uh, so if it ever came the case that that land was transferred to state government, and of course it is, you know, Prince George's County, you have my solemn commitment that I've said it everywhere I go, I would never uh, uh, discuss developing that without coming back and getting significant community input. It is a valuable piece of land. Uh, and we would not do that. So um, that's one of the questions that uh, I've gotten. Uh, there's a question on here about trim uh, and whether or not I support trim. And what I can say about trim is this, is that the county has managed um, over the last several years to really manage our budget in spite of trim. What's pretty amazing is that we have that perfect credit score, even though we do not have the ability to raise taxes. I'm not interested in raising taxes. I think that Prince George is paying enough taxes as it is. And I'm also more interested in making sure that you feel the power of your tax dollars before we ever have a discussion about it. So where we are right now is working diligently. Like we said, from DeFi, uh, the Office of Central Service, all these other agencies that you have come to rely on, what you deserve now is to make sure that you're seeing the power of the tax dollars that you already paid before I ever asked the person to give me another tax dollar. So we're not, at this point, I'm not interested in, in, uh, in addressing trend. Do I think that there may be a discussion, maybe even beyond my administration? Um, at some point, I think that, you know, the, the county has to address the issue about revenues, but I think the way to do that is by creating commercial revenues and not by continuing to tax uh, residents. So that's what I feel um, about that. Um, and I think the other two questions, the only other two questions are about the upscale retail, um, organic shops like Mom's, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. Like I told you, uh, we're going to be in, uh, in Las Vegas and we're going to do our best to bring back uh, many of those who are really optimistic about it. Um, I should tell you also that I'm so excited about a lot of the development that is happening around Prince George's. You probably heard about New Carrollton, for example, uh, where the WMATA just chose uh, that site as its new headquarters. Uh, we have the Kaiser there. That's a billion dollar project is what I should tell you. And people are coming to Prince George's County. This is such, we have the most undeveloped land left in the state. Uh, so many people do want to come here. The, the challenge for us, and the thing that I assure you, is that we will agree to nothing that does not benefit this community. The, the question is not what's best for the person developing, it's what's best for you. So as we look at each of these projects, making sure that we not only accept projects that bring value to you. Uh, the area around the new hospital, we need more primary care uh, there, so we're making sure that we are uh, laser focused on primary care uh, for the county. Um, and then the last piece of it was just about a drive and movie theater property. Uh, to be honest with you, I have to get back with you about that because I don't have an answer about what we'll do with the new uh, drive and uh, theater. There's, if you don't mind, I know a couple more this, uh, but I have a neglect of the gentleman here. Can we answer his question? Thanks for coming out. Uh, recently, there were several bills that were just passed at the state law. One was a tax uh, credit for cameras, for individuals to put up cameras. That becomes effective June 30th. And also, there was a bill that was just passed where seniors were going to be given a discount. They were in their homes in the county for up to 40 years, I believe it is. Who, who do I contact to find out about these two programs? Mr. Chairman. Do I still get paid as deputy director? <laughs> That was enabling legislation that the state passed that would allow the county to do it if they so choose. So it's not, it's law in the sense that we made an enabling, but I think it would require secondary action on behalf of, of the county council in order for it to become law. So I'm not really sure you know, how much more I can add to that point. We did it to, to allow that to occur, but we didn't mandate it on the county. So it's, you know, it's a local act would be required. I believe.
believe that is Delia Walker's bill, if I'm not mistaken. And what was this, the second one? Uh, we were uh, tax break and we were home for the next number of years. That was June 30th. This was it June 30th or June 1st? June 30th, I believe, for 2019. And again, it's, it's up to the count. Right, and, uh, that, that was the second piece. I, I thought that was the bill you were referring to. Again, we, we don't like to mandate it at the state level what the county should do. But when we hear certain things or certain issues, we will uh, we'll pass it, and that's essentially what we did. It would allow for the county to, to um, have those type of breaks. It, but it would require, if I'm not mistaken, that's a secondary action we built on behalf of the locals. So we didn't mandate it from the state, but we gave them the, uh, because, of, because of the way the tax laws is, is set up, we provided them the opportunity to do it with the enabling legislation if they wanted to implement it. So I think that's still discussions that uh, our local representatives still have to have, and, and we'll see if they, um, if, you know, if, if, if they feel it's appropriate to go forward with it at this time. Well, can I just, um, before we can, we can take the last two questions, if you allow me this one point of privilege while uh, Derek is standing here, just to say something uh, that I was going to wait till the very end to say, is you all probably read about this. We're so proud of Delegate Derek Davis. Uh, he, first of all, has served our county up for 25 years as a delegate. Um, and he's a, a, a person who is homegrown like I am, went to Central High School. Uh, and has served us with distinction in the House of Delegates. He is now chairman of a very powerful committee called Economic Matters. And you all probably read very recently that when there was an opportunity uh, to elect the Speaker of the House, which is the top presiding officer uh, in the state of Maryland, in Prince George's County, uh, made a very big push and said, we believe and we deserve to have a person in statewide office who is a presiding officer from Prince George's County. Uh, we also said that after 260 years of never having had a woman serve in that position or an African American, and we thought it was high time that we should be considered the qualified candidates who could serve us statewide. Derek stepped up, raised his hand, and said that he wanted to be considered. And really hard for that. We were not able to get Derek into that position, but he represented us so mightily. I just wanted to make sure that you all know how proud we are that we have people in our delegation. in positions of leadership in Annapolis. All these matters we're talking about, the money that comes back to our state, I mean our county, we talk about road improvements, economic development, development, health, and all of those things really matter. So I just want to thank him publicly for stepping up for Prince George's and saying that he believes that we should have that leadership right here in our own county. We're going to keep fighting. We just want to thank you so much, Derek, for your leadership. I have two burning questions here. Okay? So let's go on. Uh, my name is Valerie Wood. I'm going to try to say this very quickly, so I apologize for speaking fast since I know you have to go. I submitted a written question, and specifically about my street. But it is a more general question. The question I submitted was about a house next door to me and one four doors down where there was a drug business being conducted. We worked very closely with the police. I know Officer Blackwell and Officer Green, they were the first two people I greeted when I walked up. I'm glad to know that they do a good job, but I don't want to know that well. For six years, these people have been in our neighborhood. The level of crime is not high enough to be high priority, but it is ongoing. Six years is a substantial amount of time. The police have tried several tactics. We need some way to address these crimes which are lower level, but in the cumulative, are substantial. My yard has been set on fire. My car has had the windshield broken. My neighbor's car has been vandalized. My house has been broken into. My neighbor's house has been broken into. I can go on and on. Women have been beaten in front of my house. I have it on video. I have nine cameras around my house. We cannot get rid of them. I have the stench of marijuana on my street. The other households on my street are representative of what Prince George's wanted. Our kids have gone to Maryland schools. My child is a graduate of Maryland College Park. Two, Towson. One, UMBC. 
We are what you want. We need some help. And I'm sorry I'm excited, but I waited to ask this question. Thank you. So we're going to thank you so much for that question, and I am so sorry for what you had in your day. I am so sorry for what you had in your We're going to chief work together with D High and see what strategy we can come up with. This is a nuisance property, is what we're describing. Uh, is that these people are a nuisance. Are you okay? My head is Oh, by the way, we have it before the nuisance abatement board. They've got a thousand dollar fine. I've got nothing else to do now. Okay, well let's see let's see what else we can come up with. Um, the chief is here and uh, and, and we're gonna we're gonna see what else we can um, what else we can do. This is happening in my community, um, and this is a situation where a neighbor comes to us and complain that there's syringes and rubber gloves in the um, public area. And so he's put in a 311, we contacted the EPI, inspectors went out to this home, and what we found is that the owner no longer lives there, he lives in Africa, he's rented it out to a person who's operating an assisted living facility. When the inspectors went, they found that he did have a use and occupancy license for five people. He had eight people in there. Then another inspector come along and he said, well, you know, we need these assisted living facilities in this area. I said, yes, but our use, our use covenant for our HOA says you cannot use your residential home for a commercial business. All I'm asking is to try and prevent the county from issuing use and occupancy licenses when the HOA public says you cannot run a business. Thank you. Well, I think that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, absolutely. We'll look at it and look at the strategy and again, revisit that particular property you're talking about and it's continuing to be an instance for you. Yes, ma'am. So I know we're going to miss some, and uh, I can come back. Can we just take one more? Because you know what? After that, we're going to have some folks who will stay around after the meeting. So for anyone else who we weren't able to um, take answer, and Nisha and the rest of the team. Thank you. 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 Thank 3,000 people. There's only two ways, that's a very tiny area to get into. I haven't heard anything about structure. Where I live, it's a, the main entry is a circle. And as you know, a lot of people can't drive in a circle. Our condo building has a hit, a car has run into it. So I'm wondering if all the agencies, agencies we have here, or someone can tell me what's going on. And my final question, I'll make this quick. I live in a condo and they decided to put a Merlin adult medical daycare center in there. I don't know why that's in the mixed use community. I'm over top of this development. I had 22 at minimum Metro Access, Uber, Lyft, and their two buses. And these buses just run. That field is coming in my house. Uh, they start the buses up at 5 30 in the morning, even though they are open to 8 30. So who can I talk to about that? Um, because this is a serious problem. Those buses, I mean, you know, when they back up, they beat the they drop the lift. I'm a senior, but it does not belong in a residential area. It should be in a strip mall or something. Thank you. Family, we want to thank you so much for taking the time and being scared to come see us. And we would like to have you back again a little bit later. But we want we want to give you a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you.